joining us for the first Fossil Roadshow. This one is a trial run, and we're going to be focusing on identification of trilobites. The expert who's joining us is Dr. Brenda Hunda from the Cincinnati Museum Center. And in this case, Dr. Bruce McFadden is an amateur when it comes to invertebrate fossils, and so he's showing us some trilobites um, that he has and is going to get Brenda's uh, input on what they might be. Um, if you have any technical problems or any problems connecting, please uh, feel free to reach out to us in the chat box or check out the uh, troubleshooting guide. Excellent, thanks. So let's get started. Um, good. So today we're going to talk about the trilobites, and then there'll be some discussion. And then Brenda's included some helpful resources if you need further information to identify trilobites. Then we're going to do a question and answer, and then and then a wrap up. All right. So the story behind my trilobites. Actually, they're not my trilobites. They're my wife Jeanette's trilobites. <laughs> so we travel a lot. I travel a lot. And in our in our foyer and in our house, we have a cabinet of curiosities. Actually, it's Jeanette's cabinets of curiosity, which is her fossil collection. I don't have a private fossil collection, um, but anyway. So this is her shelf in one of our bookshelves with uh, showing some of our curiosities. And in the middle of the shelf, in the middle shelf, you can see that it's her fossil collection. And if you look closely, there's stuff from all over the world. There's stuff from there's stuff from the Devonian of there's a plant in the upper right hand corner from the Devonian of New York State that was given to me as a gift by a former professor at Cornell. There's a big tortoise shell in the uh, in the right hand lower right hand corner from the Badlands of of Nebraska. Uh, in sort of the center, there's a clam shell. That's a Chesapectin that I collected for Jeanette when I did a, a, a my fossil field trip a couple of years ago. There's also a baby tortoise. There are two other smaller tortoises that Jeanette really prizes. Her, one of her prized possessions is the is the lighter colored tortoise shell just to the right of that bowl in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's you can see a nice shark's tooth that's from Morocco in that bowl and then on the left the left bowl there are also some more pectin like animals uh in the uh in the left back there is a vertebrae of a mammoth or a mastodon that was given to uh given to Jeanette by one of our neighbors who had uh who was downsizing his his various um curios and trinkets and he gave that to Jeanette there are two polished ammonites that you can see and I honestly can't remember. I think they are from Morocco, but I'm not sure. But then the object of our affection here for this discussion, there are three tri trilobites uh, in a row in front of the, um, the two polished ammonites on the left-hand side of Jeanette's um, fossil collection. And these are what we're going to focus on now. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated to, f to learn more about these. So, the fr so these are the three fossils. And we're going to discuss them one and one by one. We're going to discuss the one at the bottom first. Then we're going to discuss the one in the upper right hand corner. And then finally, we're going to discuss the one that I'm particularly fascinated about because of, because it's just very, very interesting, the one in the upper left hand corner. All right. So, um, 20 years ago, Jeanette and I were on sabbatical in Bolivia. Hold these trilobite either latest Silurian or Devonian, but I'm not sure. But what I do recall from this particular specimen is that it's of a trilobite. I think it's I think it's a phacopid, but I'm not sure. Um, and it's what I know is that the, the upper Silurian and Devonian sequence in the Andes of Bolivia is one of the largest packages of of sediments of that age in the world. It's a classic sequence. It's not as well known as some of the more better studied Devonian, Devonian of the world, but it nevertheless is quite spectacular and forms a lot of the core, the cores of many of the mountains in the in the Andes around around uh, Bolivia. And as I said, I was on a Fulbright uh, back 25 years ago, and Jeanette was actually a volunteer in an orphanage. We had a wonderful time there. Moroccan, it's Bolivian, correct? Um, we needed a change. Yeah, two, me, two of the three are Moroccan. Uh, one is Boli one is Bolivian. Through uh, Moroccan okay. um, publications for identification, and um, there's lots of them. It didn't 
the preservation, the taphonomy did not fit sort of the Moroccan style of, of preservation. Um, and so it is a fake copid um, for sure. One of the ways that we can, um, several of the defining characteristics that we can tell from these trilobites is the very large eyes and the large number of, um, or the height of the eyes, the palpebral lobes. Um, fake copid trilobites tend to have the Scheiser curl eyes that have a lot of lenses within files we call them, and that's sort of a definitive characteristic. So right away when I saw the eyes, I knew that it was a fake copid. Another defining characteristic is the conservative um, morphology of the thorax and the tail in these animals. Um, it's just very plain, doesn't have any spikes, doesn't seem to have really any um, uh, uh, flanges off of the pleura of the thorax. And another defining characteristic is, is the type and style of furrows on the glabella. Um, this trilobite is kind of hard to identify really any further down to that. I thought it might be Acastoides. Um, initially, I'd have to double check that with some of the geology of the Devonian of Bolivia to make sure. Um, we certainly can link it down to, um, to the family level. But it is a crackout specimen. It has a lot of sort of mineralization on it. And the, the defining, some of the defining characteristics that might allow me to determine the generic and species level are um, in the front. I think actually there's an art, there was a, a large bulletin in the American Museum of Natural History of Trilobites of Bolivia that Niles Eldridge published. Yeah, because um, I, was kind of I seem to recall Moroccan, recall that in, in my reprint collections. I'll take a look and Bolivian see if I can stuff, find it before it, it makes sense before now the we're webinar. Talking about it, and um, that's something that I can easily look up in advance and um, sure. and find out. That wouldn't be yeah. much of a problem. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, that's really interesting. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, so the next one I also think is, is a fake hoppet, and I know that that's from Morocco. And I would have called it fake hops, but now I understand that it's been the, na the, ge the genus name of fake hops, in, or at least part of the genus of fake hops, has been changed to Eldridge hops uh, in, uh, in honor of Niles Eldridge. And I should also say that Niles Eldridge was one of my professors on my PhD committee and he taught me a lot about macroevolution and he was a very charismatic professor he also encouraged my interest in fossil horses and evolution when I was a graduate student I always found him to be um, a very intellectually engaging and very interesting person so uh, I'm glad that fake hops at least part of it has been renamed elder jobs but anyway so this is a specimen of a beautiful concretion that um, that I acquired in Morocco. Unfortunately, the top of the specimen, we used to have it, and it's gone missing. Um, and we and my wife, Jeanette, we're not really sure how that's happened, but needless to say, this is uh, really the definition and the, so, the shape, the morphology of this trilobite in this concretion is really exquisite in my mind, it. and it's, it's really it's beautiful. It's a real specimen. I'm serious. Um, and like, whoa! And I think, wow! Are you yes. serious? Wow! I think so. Because okay, that's that's fascinating. So what you're saying is that they carve this. Hi. Come here, Jeanette. Come here. I want to show you something. This is my wife. Hi. This is my wife, and she's not going to be on the road show, but that's Brenda. <laughs> We're hey. doing this is absolutely fa this is absolutely fascinating. Brenda is a paleontologist and expert on trilobites, and yeah. we're doing a mock presentation about the road show. She doesn't think that's a real specimen. She <gasps> thinks she thinks, yeah, it could be. Anyway, anyway, so it is from Morocco, so you know how they are. But anyway, Brenda, <laughs> this is absolutely fascinating. So and what is and this part? impromptu sort of thing is not going to happen on the on the webinar. But anyway, this the what I did, Jeanette. Let me just show you what we're doing. Um, this is this is a departure. You'll have to take off the time, Eleanor. We're doing a trial run where I'm going to meet with with. So uh, are we're, they all cards? We're doing a road show. Oh. 
And what I'm doing is I'm saying that we're talking about your fossil collections and the trilobites. Okay. And you're going to be famous now, Janetti. No, I'm going to have fake stuff. Oh. <laughs> okay, so we're back to this fake trilobite, well, which is absolutely fascinating. I, would, I honestly I don't, don't need think to so. Exactly she doesn't, she doesn't believe it's wrong, fake. But I do believe anything is fake. She believes anything is fake. Believes anything is um, fake. So anyway, so, go ahead, Brenda. Uh, Moroccans, of course, are famous for sell, selling fake trilobites. Um, they do uh, really yeah. sort of three major techniques. The first is they paint them. Yeah. The second is they um, glue pieces on together that don't belong on. Um, and third, they, um, they add Bondo, yeah. an auto body putty, yeah. um, to fill in spaces. Um, and they also, I guess there's a fourth, they carve. Yeah. They do a lot of carving with air abrasive tools and micro jacks. And one of the reasons, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So one of the things that struck me about this particular specimen right away um, is actually yep. twofold. First yeah. is uh, that um, the um, free cheeks on the side of the head, um, my thought is, is that they're either very diminutive or missing from the animal. I'd have to look at the specimen. But the key feature to me is that the number of thoracic segments is more than what would be a lot would be normally in this family, and they're not evenly distributed. So if you look at the top of the thorax, yeah, you can see that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, maybe fourteen, thirteen thoracic segments, but there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah. eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three pleurae on one side. So there's thirteen axial rings and twenty-three pleurae. It should be a one-to-one -one match. So they have carved extra pleurae in there that don't match up with the axis of the animal. And you can see at the top of the thorax that they're more widely distributed, and then as you get down towards the tail. Uh, they're more closely spaced. I don't know of any animal, of any trilobite that has a mismatch of axial rings to pleurae. And so right away, right away that was an a indication to me that they had been doing some extra carving. Wow. Well, cool. it depends. You know, parts of the trilobite may be real. You know, I'd have to look. I mean, the... It may be that they added a fascinating. So you think this was carved completely de novo, and, and there was no. And that's interesting. Um, properly. Um, would, so that's not to say they're not real elements, but it's not a real okay. species. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's meant to be. Yeah. It's, yes, it's meant to be a fake copid for sure. Um, just like the Bolivian one, no doubt. And uh, but it's very not interesting. Dying. Okay, Man. so it's not Eldridge Ops. <laughs> <laughs> it's Artifact Ops. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Very very interesting. Thank you. And the last one is absolutely the last one is absolutely beautiful, and I personally think that it's a fake. How in the world? This is to me. It's it's a absolutely beautiful. Spe so okay, forget about that part. Uh, I acquired this for my wife because it, it's an absolutely beautiful specimen, but Morocco. it just seems too delicate and too much going on for it to possibly be real. Well, so yes. if you tell me that this That's is a, a this is a forgery. Uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Yeah, you see the three spines on the lock. What is the that? Occipital ring and the eye, the palpebral lobe, and the big. It's known affectionately as the trident. Whoa. Light. Um, and. Uh, what? Right. That's and there's real. There's actually three species described from Morocco. There may be more now. This is since Whoa. 2006. I what? was pretty lucky on this one because the guy, Gosh. Brian Chatterton, who described it was my master's advisor. Okay. And the time that he was collecting these in Morocco, yes. nobody believed that him sense. that they were real. Um, and so I was able to see these, and then he uh, um, you know, was able to show that they were real, and now there's multiple species of them. So this is uh, Wellicerops um, trifurcatus, and um, oh. it's very unusual, of course, in that it has this very large front forked trident on the front of it 
And there's actually a progression, an evolutionary progression in these trilobites where the trident spike is initially attached to the head. I'll show you a picture. Here's another species. And then it progressively moves further and further off the front of the head in, in uh, various lineages. Off of the what are the hats the, on the, the top? The matrix underneath has not. What are those been three things the in the, in the on, on the top? The matrix, um, those very very delicate right, right. wafer wafer There's wafer shaped like, thing. What are those things? About, um, the purpose of the trident in these animals. They're spines. They okay. Molt okay. With something like this, because molting is already dangerous enough. Um, and so there's no real consensus, but there's sure. thought to be analogous sure, sure. And they to would the break. horns and rhinoceros beetles. Yeah. Um, but Interesting. Uh, you know, maybe for display or um, uh, mating, they don't think they're in uh, use for any yeah. kind of self-defense. Yeah. It would be too delicate. But whatever the case yeah. may be, it's kind of perhaps like the, the old Irish elk story, you know, where um, sexual selection uh -huh. just runs amok. There's... There's really no definitive proof that um, there's dimorphism, sexual dimorphism in these animals, although that has been suggested, and that the males would have the longer tridents um, associated with them. But it's a, it's very fascinating because certainly yeah. the structure is important enough to put all that energy and effort into making it and maintaining it from an evolutionary standpoint. So they are fascinating. Yeah. Um, probably, in this case, probably around Ifelian. So it's going to be Devonian. Middle Devonian. Yeah. Yes. Fascinating. Like the so these are often, wow. yeah, these what are often age, What age is it? Associated with, um, permaspids and phacopids. Absolutely. Uh-huh. So it did it, ha, did I, it I, live... <laughs> Did it live alongside um, fake hops I think or fake hops? One that you didn't think, and I think is all trilobites. Really, what you what we have to do is kind of piece it together regionally, um, and uh, and also use uh, web resources. So I've put a couple of of resources that I use um, for the area that I'm in here in Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky to give you an example of the types of guidebooks and fossil books that you can find for various, perhaps various states of the United States and regions of the world. So Fossils of Ohio is a very good definitive, um, you know, uh, fossil identification guide. It's a little bit more sophisticated than amateur guides, um, but it goes through all the fossils, of course, including trilobites. How do I, do I advance this, Eleanor? Yes, you can. It's in the lower corner there. Oh, got it. Thank you. Um, if you happen to live in the state of New York or have trilobites from that area, there's also these more popular books, Trilobites of New York, <clears throat> that have beautiful photographic um, photographic color plates um, of fossils that can help you identify trilobites. Uh, there's also some there's a, there, books there's online. A, there, um, these are more of a historical yeah. Um perspective of paleontology of various states that have been digitized that you might be able to use to help identify trilobites. One of the definitive websites for at least getting your trilobites down to order, if not uh, further down, would be um, Samuel Gon's uh, website, A Guide to the Orders of Trilobites. There's a lot of photos in there. A lot of trilobite experts contribute to this website. So um, this is one that uh, we feel is fairly well trusted. Uh, once again, you know, searching for identification on the web, um, you've got to be careful with what you're getting. There's a lot of collectors and sellers out there that don't know what they have, but this website is one that um, that most trilobite paleontologists are aware of and can and do contribute to. Uh, there's also uh, places to go and people to talk to um, in your local amateur paleontology clubs and your fossil clubs. Uh, these are people who have very important resources and information regarding fossil identification in the area that they collect in. Many of them actually know more about the fossil fauna than the professionals in that area do uh, because they're out there collecting and identifying. And so a couple of amateur paleontology groups that I have that I deal with regularly in my area are the dry dredgers and the Kentucky Paleontological Society. 
but most states have their version um, and they're out in the field collecting. So using them as a reference to help you identify specimens you find in your area is very, very important and helpful. And another place to go is state surveys. Um, oftentimes they have educational resources for teachers, um, for students and the public. They have fossil guidebooks that help to discuss the geology and paleontology of that state. Um, sometimes they even have, like in the case of Kentucky, Kentucky fossil identification keys that help you identify the fossils you may have found in Kentucky. So every state will have their own resources, but it's definitely a place um, to go ahead and take a look. There we go. For some reason it was sticking. It wouldn't let me unmute. So yeah, I think that that, um, I think that went really well. I love the uh, surprises that were in there. And the sort of a, anatomy 101 for basic trilobiology, we'll, we'll definitely put that in the beginning of this. And then we're, we pretty well have the core of the, of the webinar. Well, thank you both so much for, for doing this trial run, and um, I will be in contact, Brenda, um, as we get closer, and, uh, and then... So, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, thanks Safe a lot. Travel. Thanks, Have Eleanor. Fun. I'll be into work at about 1 o'clock, so we'll hopefully touch base. Take care. All right. Thanks to you both. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thanks, Eleanor. Okay. Okay, sounds great. Thanks, Brenda. Bye. All right, bye.